Good evening. The meeting of the Gilroy Unified School District Board of Education is now in order. Um, before we start, I would like to take a minute to recognize one of our former employees who has recently passed away, and that is Marlene Hughes. She worked for the district for 34 years. Her last assignment was as the assistant um, administrative assistant, pardon me, for the superintendent. And uh, Marlene was smart, um, quick-witted, very honest and direct, if anybody here know, knew Marlene. And um, I was uh, privileged to work with her. And you always knew where Marlene stood. She was honest and direct. And I want to give my uh, condolences out to her family and uh, take just a minute right now to think of Marlene and rest easy, Marlene. Okay, and now we will start our meeting with the Pledge of Allegiance, and I understand we have special guests who are leading us in the pledge. Do we know? Okay. Ah. And while they're getting ready, ¿hay alguien aquí que necesita intérprete para la junta? This meeting is being recorded, sorry. It's been a while since I've done this in person, so excuse me. This meeting is being recorded or broadcast. Images and sounds may be captured of those attending this meeting. So smile. And now we're ready. Thank you, girls. Tell us who you are first. Introduce yourselves. Hi, everyone. My name is Taylor. My name is Aubrey. My name is Jessica. And my name is Skylar. And you are members of? The Christopher girls soccer team. Yes, I wanted you to tell us, not me. <laughs> Thank you very much. We are very proud of you and go right ahead. Hi everyone, would you please remove your hats and place your right hand over your heart? Stand up, please. My bad guys. Okay, ready, salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You may be seated. Thank you, well done. And now we have recognition. Oh, we have to approve the agenda before we have recognition. May I have, do I have a motion? I will move to approve the agenda. Second. And we don't have to do a roll call vote. Yay. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, any against? Okay. Motion carries. Thank you. And now we have recognition. Thank you, Ms. Pacino. First of all, I'm really, I'm Debbie Flores. I'm the superintendent of the district for the, I think everybody knows that, but just in case. And we are just thrilled tonight to, to welcome our staff and students who have achieved great accomplishments during the school year back to our boardroom. This is one of our favorite parts of every board meeting where we get to recognize the accomplishments of our students and staff. Tonight, our first recognition is for student athletes and coaching staff of the 2022 CIF NorCal Division IV Champions Christopher, Christopher High School Girls Soccer Team. <laughs> the 2022 Christopher High School Girls Soccer Team had an amazing season, the most accomplished in the school's history. The team won the Pacific Coast Athletic League title second in a row Central Coast section title, and as I just mentioned, was the CIF NorCal Division IV champion. That's really amazing. This championship is the first ever in Christopher High's history, so making it a very, very special accomplishment. In addition to the team's accomplishments, individual student athletes were also recognized for their achievement. 
Senior, I apologize if I say your known names incorrectly. Senior Aisha, Aisha Sandoval was league MVP and first team all league. Two seniors and a junior, I'll say their name, were first team all league. Let me say their names. Senior Taylor Mejia, senior Jenna Urbasso, and junior Kaya Stewart. And then we have two seniors, a junior and a freshman who were second team all league. And let me tell you who they were. Skylar Triello, Jessica Schween, Carly Silva, and Ella Altinger. Congratulations. <laughs> and my understanding is that the future looks bright. That must mean a bunch of you are coming back for future wins. We hope to see you at the same place next year. And supporting these student athletes throughout their high school careers is a stellar coaching staff led by head coach Matt Ottinger. I hope I'm saying that right, Matt. If not, you can correct. You can correct me when you come up. Uh, he was assisted by Darlene Del Carmen and Alfredo Achuri. And of course, the entire program was supported by many of the people in this room, countless parents and other family members and fans. I was able to attend the championship game. It was a thrill to be there and watch the match. I it was a nail biter. I was like, oh my God, are they gonna score? And they did, and they won 1-0. And it was just such, such an exciting game. And we are so proud of you. Ladies, your accomplishments on the field and in the classroom, and most importantly for the role models you are for all younger players that you've become, who've watched you play with such courage and honor is really remarkable. It is players like you who inspire future generations of student athletes to dream big. Thanks to the community who tirelessly supports our student athletes in all sports and all of our students in Gilroy Unified. I'd like to ask the team to come up here so that we can recognize you. And please join me in a round of applause for these amazing ladies. The coaching staff, can you come up also? We're good. I'm going to take this off for the picture. Yeah, maybe some of you could get on your knees. Do you mind? Can you get? Yeah, we'll like. That would be great. Oh, that'll work. Great. Thank you. The soccer team photo and post. <laughs> yeah, I saw one at the uh, after the game. <laughs> All right, friends and family, photos? Oh, oh boy. <laughs> That's way too many cameras. <laughs> Don't leave. Quick, quick. You want me to do? Well, these are. No, these are all. Ladies, can you come over and we'll help? Tell us your name. Do you want me to? That's good. That's me. Thank you. Okay. You know who they are. Yeah, I can. What's your name? Here. We got to do this. Thank you. We got to do. Yeah, no problem. Uh, Bryce. Uh, Sophia. There you go. Sophia. What's your name? Sorry. Emma. Uh, I think you're Coach Ella. Ella. You know who they are. Oh. Uh, I have other Sophie. Great. 
Do I have a soap? I, Aisha's not here. Aisha's here. Aisha? Jessica, you yeah. There you go. Congratulations. Oh. Madison? Not. Jealous not. Madison, Madison. There you go. Chloe and Taylor? Ryan. Chloe's Ryan. here. Ryan. Yeah. Taylor? Are you Taylor? There you go. All right. Is it everybody now? Yep, everybody's got one, right? Okay. Yep. Yeah, we were asking yep. if you would mind right that way. This Congratulations. Door. We are so proud of you. Now, good job, ladies. Great job. Some are labeled and then Oh, these perfect, are perfect. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Great Thanks, job. guys. Congratulations. 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 Great job. Thank you so much. Oh, wow. We still have, we still have quite a crowd. <laughs> okay. All right, I'm gonna move on to our next recognition. Now we're switching high schools. We're talking about some of our Gilroy High uh, athletes. So we're really proud to recognize two student athletes from the Gilroy High School wrestling team. Sophomore Cody Merrill won a CIF state wrestling title at 195 pounds. And Jennifer Soto won a state title at 125 pounds. <laughs> Jennifer became the sixth girl in the CIF Girls Championship 10 year history to win three state titles during her high school career. The GS GHS girls team finished in second place overall, the best ever finish in the program's history. Two other wrestlers finished in the top 10 for the girls championships. The boys team finished ninth in the state and three other Gilly High wrestlers finished in the top 10 of the boys championship. Both Jennifer and Cody are in training to make the US team for the world team trials in the spring. So we are expecting, not hoping, we are expecting to recognize you for some more titles. <laughs> <laughs> the Gilroy High School boys wrestling team is coached by Daniel Cormier. Is he here? No? Anyway, I bet he's very busy. <laughs> Assistant coaches are Tony Andrade, Bill Newton, Darren Nguyen, Erasmo Gutierrez, and Aurelio Perez. Are they here? No? Hey, come on up. <laughs> Thanks for being here. Did I say it all wrong? Yeah, it's Sorry. This it happens my whole life. It's okay. Say it. Uh, it's actually Duran win. <laughs> <laughs> and it's Antonio Andrade, not Tony Andrade. <laughs> I'm just reading, putting in the script. Sorry. It's okay. <laughs> All right, thanks for being good sports about me messing up your names. <laughs> All right, the entire program was supported by countless parents and other family members and fans. Thank you to the, to the community who tirelessly, tirelessly supports our wrestlers and all our students at Gilroy Unified. Jennifer and Cody, many congratulations to both of you. Thank you for representing your school and our district so well. Congratulations. This way? Yeah. Oh, because of this. Okay. Steve, you want to Come on, Big Steve. You want a picture, Steve? Come on, Big Steve. Congratulations. Oh, wait, Jennifer, sorry, Cody. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Did you get them? Yep. Good. Okay, last but not least by any means, 
is we want to recognize Jeff Myers. Jeff, would you please come up? Thanks, Jeff. Great to see you. So our final recognition tonight is Jeff Myers. He's cross country and track and field coach at Christopher High. In December, Coach Myers was named the 2021 California Boys Track and Field Outdoor Coach of the Year by the National Federation of State High School Association. Congratulations. <laughs> He was nominated by the California Interscholastic Federation for this honor and is one of 660 coaches recognized in 2021 with state, sectional, and national awards. Honorees were selected based upon their coaching performance in 2021, lifetime community involvement, school involvement, and coaching philosophy. Coach Myers is a legend at Christopher High School, where he's a campus supervisor during the day before he puts on his coaching hat. We've heard that on professional development days, coach will distribute frozen treats from a cool chest that he has connected to his golf cart to staff while on campus. He always has a warm welcome for visitors to the Christopher High School campus and is a favorite of staff, students, and the superintendent. <laughs> he is the biggest cheerleader for his programs and works tirelessly to create an inclusive and positive environment for anyone who wants to join his program. Coach Myers uses his social media platform to highlight the achievements of his student athletes on and off the field and celebrates the success of the entire Cougar community. <laughs> Coach Myers has coached a number of Paralympic athletes while at Christopher High, including a US track and field All-American. He embodies everything we could hope for an employee and a coach. A demonstrated commitment to excellence in an uplifting and inclusive culture for all his student athletes. The, the Cougar community is lucky to have you and so are we as a district. Coach Myers, on behalf of the Board of Education, thank you for all that you do for your students and be, for just being such a genuine, caring person. Oh, so the kids, she's calling. Oh, yeah. Anybody else who wants to come up with coach? I'm in. I'm in. I'm in. i I'm in. Thank you so much, Coach. Thank you. Board members, at this time, we're going to take a five minute intermission so the room can clear and the next group can come in if needed. So if you need to make a stop, go ahead.
Okay. And we're back. And Dr. Flores has a couple of introductions she wants to make. I, I would ask the board to indulge me to cover something not on the agenda because they're here tonight. So I don't know if you've met our two new SROs and I would like to introduce, why don't you guys come in a little bit? <laughs> they offered to help tonight and it, I thought I'd take advantage of having them here. So Dustin O'Dell started first week of December, yes. somewhere in there. Yeah. And Andrew Lopez, you started in January? In January. So we now are finally back at our former level with two SROs. They're doing a great job. Everything I hear about them is very good. And I'm, we're looking forward to giving you a report about that at our next board meeting on April 21st. But I thought since they were here, we would introduce them. And I actually think we probably don't even need you to stay because we have so, so few people here tonight. <laughs> but anyway, thanks for being here. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Good to meet you. Welcome. Okay, item 3D, general public comment. Do we have any cards? We do not have any cards. We have no cards and no public comments. And so we will go into E, report of action taken in closed session. And there was no action taken in closed session. So now we will go to item four, our student board representative, Allison Blanco from Mount Madonna High School. If we're all a little giddy, it's because this is the first time in a long time that we've been back in person. So it's good to see you folks. Good job, Allison, already. You're going to be great. Don't worry, you're going to be great. It's fancy. Good evening, board president, Linda Piceno. School Board Trustees, Superintendent Dr. Flores, and members of Cabinet. My name is Alison Blanco. I'm a senior at Mama Donna High School and will be graduating this year. Thank you for having me here this evening. I will be presenting a school presentation for Mama Donna and preschool program. Now I'll be doing the presentation for my school, Mama Donna High School. Here we can appreciate a picture of my classmates. This picture was taken when we did the candy, candy gram cells. Past events. On February 4th, we had the virtual award ceremony for second quarter. On February 14th to February 18th, we did the Spirit Week for Friendship Day. Scholarship workshops in January and February. We worked with Ms. Elgato and CalSUP tutors to complete applications. March 11th, free health screening for all students. Santa Clara County Healthier Kids Project. We had free dental vision and hearing screens. Current events. Class presentation from Santa Clara County Behavioral Therapist, Tobacco Prevention and Intervention. Here we talk about the harms and repercussions tobacco can have. For example, it can damage your lungs and this can be really dangerous, especially at this time with COVID-19 going on. PBIS classroom presentation, reinforce school-wide expectations. Here we did posters about our school rules, about being safe, being respectful and being responsible. Future events, March 20th and 30th, we have the LPAC testing. On April 12th, ProCrom Sports League starts again. We're invited to their kickoff season softball game. On April 19th and 20th, we have the MAP testing. On April 26th and 28th, we have the SBAC interims. Graduation, on cer on graduation ceremony on June 7th. Last but not least, USD Preschool where Bright Future begins. The preschool program consists of three locations, the Swanston site that includes their state preschool, special education preschool, and where their speech and language services are provided. The other sites are Glenview State Preschool and Rock Kelly Preschool. This preschool mission is to provide an early education program that fosters each child's social, emotional, physical, and cognitive growth to enable them become, to become independent, confident, and successful learners. The program incorporates a wide variety of experiences and teaches strategies to accommodate the needs of all the students. Past activities. The last unit of study was the farm. Students learn about farms and their role. They learn about the pro products we get from farms. 
They spend time learning about characteristics of pumpkins and practicing sentence, sentences describing the different kinds of pumpkins. The classroom transformed into farms and students were able to pretend they were making a cow, collecting eggs and selling items at the farm's market. They celebrated Dr. Seuss and reading by having guest readers. Students made Dr. Seuss hats. Students also practiced their fine motor skills by coloring the cat in the hat. Current activities. They're currently learning about different types of animals and their life cycles. Teachers do draws and labels like the ostrich shown above, read variety of books, teach life cycles of animals and insects like the butterfly, and do artworks and activities related to their theme of study. Every day is an adventure at preschool. Students practice defined motor skills daily. Some days students will play with shaving cream and practice writing their name with it. Other days, they color and paste. On St. Patrick's Day, students were able to string fruit loops and make rainbow necklaces. Students are also encouraged to practice the gross modern skills daily. Students spend at least 30 minutes out there practicing skills like running, climbing, balancing, riding tricycles, kicking and bouncing balls, or hula hooping. Upcoming activities. The last unit of study will be about the earth. Students will learn about what materials are found on earth the importance of recycling and reusing materials and ways to help our environment. They will begin enrolling new students for the next school year in late April. Their final parent meetings will be about the importance of nutrition and reading strategies for the parents to help students become successful for TK and kindergarten. Lastly, they are getting ready to celebrate all the success of all of their students. They will begin planning the preschool promotion soon. Thank you. Good job. Good job. Thank you, Allison. Great job. And now we have item five, the superintendent's report. Dr. Flores. Thank you. That was a great report. <laughs> well, my report this month won't be as long as it's been the last few meetings because I'm no longer giving a COVID update because things are pretty much back to normal. And I'll talk about that a little bit when I talk about my school site visits. But um, in the past two weeks, um, shortly after our last board meeting, we had a SPAC meeting, that's Superintendent Parent Advisory Committee meeting. And as always, the members of the committee gave us, me in particular, some really good feedback, raised some good questions and concerns. And in fact, we incorporated some of those into our new volunteer clearance process, which I'll talk about in a second. We had our first Run for Fitness meeting in three years. Is it? Good grief, two years. We haven't met in a long time because we haven't had Run for Fitness, and we are so excited. We went live this week. People have already started signing up. Melanie, how many people have signed up? Well, you can tell me in a minute. I'll keep talking. <laughs> um, I'm on the Superintendent SELPA Executive Council. We had a meeting this past week and talked about a lot of areas uh, of interest to our, our SELPA Council. Probably one of the um, most, I thought, fun events of the last few weeks was uh, last Friday, we went to Los Animas for the CENTUS Custodian of the Year finalist announcement. That was just so much fun. Um, one of our custodians was recognized and he's in the picture. It's Rigo Doya. I'll, I'll mess, mess that name up too. But anyway, we, they all call him Rigo, everybody. The kids were chanting his name as he was brought out, he had no idea what was going to happen. So he was just completely in shock. And then he was just so humble about the award. I mean, there were literally hundreds of these signs and kids were coming up afterwards, hugging him. He's clearly had a huge impact on Los Animas. So that was really cool. And we want everybody to go online and vote for him because he's one of six finalists, 10 finalists, and in the whole nation, by the way, and um, now it comes down to who votes the most. So we were trying to get Rigo the national award, and we need all of your help. I attended the Rotary Regional Speech Contest on Tuesday. I've attended these a lot of times in 20 plus years in Rotary. I have never heard such amazing speeches. So these are kids that have you know, one at their local rotary level. They've gone one level beyond that. And now it's a regional competition. Unfortunately, our students didn't reach that level, but 
they were just amazing. I mean, the Rotarians in the audience, or a lot of us at this, were just in awe of the great job they did. And then yesterday, one of my favorite events, we we had our first Future Chefs of America cook-off competition yesterday with six students that were selected out of almost 50 students that submitted recipes of their own. And what happens at Future Chefs is at three, we all come uh, to the student center and watch them from scratch create their meal. And, and this year it was after school snacks and they were just amazing. All six of them. I don't know how our three, uh, our three judges who are on each end were able to select three out of the six. They were all so good. It was a great event. Lots of parents and family members attended the event. So I wanted to give you a little bit of an update on our new volunteer clearance process. As you know, you approved that at the last board meeting, and we weren't even sure at that point how fast we could launch it. And I want to commend Dr. Winslow and his staff. Mia Perales is the new person uh, in charge of this, and they, they launched it so fast, I couldn't believe it. I mean, within a few days, it was launched. So as of today, we have 162 total people signing up, 140 are in process and 22 are already complete. So we are moving, and again, this is thanks to the onboarding process that Dr. Winslow created. Um, we've had just an amazing quick response and we have our very first parent volunteer applicant who's um, completed the entire process. And I wanna appreciate that parent for sending me a wonderful email thanking us for the great job that we're doing. We don't get those very often, so I really appreciate that. Um, the process began on March 21st at 11 p.m. and it was ready to go. And we had a uh, confirmed receipt of cl clearance of the first one on 3:23, so two days later. So um, it's working really well. And I think we'll all feel confident that our parent volunteers are uh, okay to be around our kids. That's really why this process is so important. I continue to do my every other Friday letter, although we did a special one about the parent volunteer process in between. So the next one's scheduled for March 25th. And as you know, um, I've, I've been conducting and, and going on APS visits. APS visits, go, the entire Ed Services or members of the Ed Services team, and I um, do those. Unfortunately, I missed the Christopher High School APS because there was another uh, thing I needed to do that was a higher priority. It's the first APS visit I've missed. I noticed Jeremy's already left. So I can't apologize to him again. But anyway, um, what I'm feeling, I also visited three elementary schools this past week, and the principals agree with me. If the, if half our kids weren't wearing masks, you'd you'd never know we shut down. Things are really getting back to normal. Um, we're making significant progress for students that suffer, you know, have some you know, significant um, academic deficits that occurred during the year and a half off. Amazing growth, actually. I'm just really excited about the intervention programs that all elementary schools are implementing with Fidelity and we're seeing really good results. We may not have all of our children at grade level by the end of this year, I doubt it, but I feel very optimistic about many of them, uh, those, those deficits being made up over the next year or two. And this is you know, not just our district, this is all districts, it's across the nation. It's widely uh, known in research that there were academic deficits that occurred during distance learning for some parts of our population. But I feel very optimistic about the progress that we're making in the intervention programs, not just at elementary. Uh, I'm talking K-12, but I've just been at three elementary schools, so it's very fresh in my mind. And we do have upcoming, I have upcoming spring site visits. If any of you'd like to join me, just let me know the day before I'd appreciate so I can let our principals know that you're coming with me. So you can see the list of the upcoming visits. And then there are a lot of events coming up too. So Saturday night, uh, two board members, myself, uh, GECA principal, 
and um, the student who's being recognized and the teacher who's being recognized will all be at this event. I think we're gonna have about 25 or 30 GUSD, 35 GUSD, and we're all gonna be in the same theater. I don't know how this works because it's at the, new, at the newly revised theater over there on Monterey, but it sounds like it's gonna be quite an event. And of course our, our teacher and student will be recognized and they're gonna be recognized at the board meeting following that. And do you have an answer, Melanie, on the question I asked you? Wow, that's great. And we just launched it. So we don't know how many students are gonna participate and run for fitness, but that's a really good start. And I did wanna highlight um, not only run for fitness, of course, but um, our AXO Awards celebration for Deb Padita's recognition and a student recognition. So if you wanna attend that event, please let us know so that we can register you. And Beatrice Magdaleno as our, now they have a new, new award. This will be the second or third time we've nominated someone as a new administrator of the year. So we're very excited about recognizing our two administrators and Ella Rodriguez, who I believe was here earlier this evening. So it's great to see her and we're gonna, she'll be recognized at that event too. Good. And that concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you. And now we have uh, number, item number six, consent agenda. I will entertain a motion for approval. So moved. Second. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Item number seven A, presentation on GUSD's reserves. This is an information item. Mr. Mesa. Good evening, board. Good evening, superintendent, members of the public. It's great to be back in person. Uh, tonight, I'm, I'm presenting, uh, obviously, a presentation on reserves at your request. I hope this information is both useful and easy to understand. So, um, you know, the number one question, the fundamental question we should be asking is, well, why do we need reserves? And, you know, the short answer about why the district would need a reserve, it's, it's the law. It's Title V and the sections on the slide, um, a, a key component of the reserve requirement is a sliding scale. And the sliding scale is based on the size of the district and how it's measured in terms of this specific code language is the size of your average daily attendance. And because last year, or really this year, the projected uh, average daily attendance Easily uh, 9,800, that's, that's a projection right on P2 because it goes through um, April, um, where we fall into that category of 3%, where most districts in California are above 1,000, but below 30,000. So unless you're LA Unified, or Long Beach, some of those bigger districts, you, you will have a 3% minimum state requirement reserve. The Mr. Other, Vincent, excuse me, could you explain what P2 is? Uh, period two attendance. So it's, uh, thank you. Uh, it's the very beginning of the first day of school, roughly around the middle of August, all the way through the middle of uh, April. And so the, we take attendance, right, every single day between the first day and the middle of April. And then that becomes your funded, we call it P2, is your period attendance. So from the very first day through mid-April, and if you're guessing, do you not really get funded for what happens in May and June? Technically, the answer is no, but you're obviously your, your test scores and uh, attendance is very important anyway throughout the entire year. Thank you. Thank you. Um, number one, two, and three on the bottom of the slide. Uh, number one just really clarifies how, you know, is in, what's included in the calculation of the reserve. It doesn't apply to us because we don't have what's called a special reserve fund. Um, and so it doesn't really apply to us. I think it's Fund 17. We don't have Fund 17, but other districts do transfer funds from the general fund to a Fund 17. And so to get a total um, reserve uh, calculation, you would then have to add whatever is in Fund 17 in that particular case to come up with a true uh, percent of unrestricted reserves for that purpose. Number two and three does not apply to us. And then so we've answered the why we have to have that 3% minimum reserve as a state requirement, right? It's the law, we have to do it. Um, but then there's also an adopted board policy 
that I brought up to you. Um, you know, I was luckily joined uh, by Ingo Unified. I became your CBO in 2013, July 2013. It didn't take me a whole year before I brought to you a reserve policy. So by June, and that's purposeful, it was June because you were about to be asked to approve next year's adopted budget. So obviously I couldn't change the adopted budget that I was walking into, but I could certainly dial the knot on the one that I was presenting to you for the very first time. And so that's exactly what I did. Um, I presented to you with a policy that you thankfully approved. Uh, any new policy as it's customary for the board came to you twice for a first reading and then a second reading. And so by the second reading that was on June 19, 2014, and you'll recall we were somewhat struggling with reserves uh, at that point, uh, primarily because of uh, you know, 10 years that I want to go into prior stuff. Uh, but really, we didn't have a policy um, that established a minimum reserve other than the state minimum. And that's really not a good practice. And the board approved this policy uh, 3100. And most importantly, it was phased in. So uh, we started with 5%, then 6% the following year. And you notice the language there. Ever since 1617, thereafter, we are at 7% minimum reserve. And it's the DEU means Designated Economic Uncertainty Reserve. Uh, that's what that language is for. I'm sorry for that acronym there, but that's how most um, CBOs, um, county CBOs, uh, FICMAD, the F Financial Crisis and Management Team, reserve, um, call the reserve a DEU reserve uh, um, designated for economic uncertainty. So not to fund ongoing expenses, of course, because reserve is one time. And that's, that's the key, key here. So now we've answered why is the a reserve requirement a, a minimum of three? It's the law. Why do this GUSD have a minimum reserve of 7% is your board policy? And now we got to get a clear perspective in terms of, okay, well, you know, what does it look like across the state? Does it vary? Are we in the ballpark? Where are we? Um, and so the California Department of Ed releases the statewide average reserves every closing of the books. So what you see here is where are, and they do it by type of district. So obviously we want to look at unified school districts because we are a unified school district. And so at the end of last fiscal year, uh, so this is the data that was presented to you in September, um, uh, the unified districts had a 22.3% reserve. Ours was a little bit north of 23, I think, at that point, but that's what an average means. Some are below, some are higher, um, and but they're all kind of around that um, percentage. So we're right in the ballpark uh, with unified district averages for that uh, closing of 2021. And there's also this key, um, I would say, advice or guidance, long-standing practice um, that comes from the Government of Finance Officers Association. Uh, the Financial Crisis and Management Team, FICMAT, was created by Assembly Bill 1200, which is essentially uh, has some levers that the county office as an oversight agency can pull. FICMAT, that agency was created as a result of a former district going bankrupt. Uh, and they also point to this guideline and recommendation from the um, Government of Finance Officers Association that says, look, it'd be a really good idea for, for districts, for cities, municipalities, et cetera, to have a 16 to 17% reserve. And why? Because that's roughly what they're looking at is two months worth of payroll, at least, and operating expenses, not just payroll, but overall operating expenses. That's their general rule of thumb two months of expenditures. Um, and they, in the recommendation, say uses of reserve. And it's really quite clear. Reserves are like your savings account at home. You can't go out and pretend like your savings can sustain ongoing operational expenses because then you run into a deficit, right? As soon as you would make that withdrawal, you feel it in your savings. And there's so much you can do until that savings becomes zero. And then if that new expense is ongoing, recurring, you'll 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 make you know you'll go into a negative situation. That's not that's not good for any district or any organization. So reserves are one time. And so just to give you an idea of what this one month looks like for us, this is actual data, and you can tie it later to when you see Mrs. Smith, uh, our director of finance, 
um, cash flow report. It's based on cash flow, cash outlay for one month of February. That's a typical month. And you'll note that operating expenses, obviously including payroll, the total, will exceed 10 million. And that's an average month. Sometimes it's 12. July is a, our leanest month because we just don't have that um, that amount. I think it's sometime between six and seven million. But the average is 10 million. That will put us around, based on the Governor um, Officers Association, that will put us around north of 11% if we follow that guideline. So ours is seven, but if we follow the widely recommended percentage, it would be actually 11%. Uh, to cover the two months worth of operating expenses. Uh, that's before any tentative agreements are reached, of course. And then here's a snapshot of you know what the reserves look like uh, today at second interim. Um, so this is after, obviously, uh, the September period. Second interim was just presented to you uh, two weeks ago at the previous board meeting. And so this is kind of breaking down the components of the reserve. The reserve is always going to have some element of carryover. And so uh, the carryover for us happens to be 8.1 million. And almost 2.5 million of that was deferred maintenance alone. Um, 2 million was textbook adoption carryover. Both of those two key elements are necessary and planned. Uh, for instance, take deferred maintenance. The state allocates a total of 300, I'm going to round up 34,000. 334,000 for the entirety of GUSD's deferred maintenance needs. 334,000. Then the board matches it by 380,000. So Dan's annual deferred maintenance budget is well short of $750,000 on an annual basis. So what we do is the balance of that $2.4 million of deferred maintenance took three years to save. So then this year, what are we proposing to do this coming summer with that 2.4 million finally getting around to uh, the roof projects at Gilroy High? That single project alone will wipe that entire balance. Number two, we'll get to the textbooks uh, adoptions. Those 2 million are planned and had been basically accruing and saving and carrying over for big, large textbook adoptions that we're about to have. The state doesn't fund um, all those textbook adoptions in one cycle. We just simply don't, don't receive enough revenue to accommodate for those major expenses. Those were two. And obviously, there's some site-based carryover that the sites have within their LCAP allocation, and then they, they get to keep that carryover, um, and they have to. And not all, it's the law as well, because those are kind of the supplemental and concentration components that are now site-based, and we're obligated to then turn around and make sure those are direct services at the sites. So the, the big picture here is, yes, we have a 20% reserve. This is prior to any negotiated agreements with any bargaining unit. So when the gray area says available for new commitments, that could be any commitments. Of course, we have to be careful that new commitments um, don't mean ongoing expenses, but obviously planned commitments plugged into the multi-year, analyzing it on a long-term basis. That's how you, um, what my language would be, is draw down on the reserve. Someone would say decrease the reserve, but that's exactly what um, the intention is. And uh, graphically here, uh, it, you know, the line of 7%, that just shows the board policy and the 3% state minimum. That's just to give you some context of, of where we are. Um, and it is our intention that after, you know, a, a TA with all units that we would get to that minimum 7% reserve uh, on a multi-year basis. And, you know, you cannot look at a multi-year, um, I know the board knows this, but it's more for the public. Um, you cannot look at a multi-year this year, five years ago or five years from now, and really understand that without looking at the assumptions, because it's simply like reading a, the last page of a book and then expecting to get the whole story. It's impossible. You have to look at the assumptions and then look at the numbers because the, the budget is fluid, it'll change. And so that's why these revenue assumptions and expenditure assumptions are there because they will change. And so the output will change, right? So um, just like reading a, the last page of a book doesn't tell you the whole story, this is critical to understanding a multi-year projection. In May, with the May revision, we suspect that the cost of living increase 
proposed for 2022-23 will change. It will be higher, most likely around 6% and change. That the LAO, the Legislative Analyst Office, has already said that. So we're hoping and looking at the governor to just do more than the COLA, but you know, obviously that process is still in place. It's up to the, the legislature. But this is one key element of a variable that we know we have to follow. Um, the other key variable is, okay, well, what happens with enrollment? Our projections based on uh, power school or decision insight is that the next two years really marginal decline of 29 next year, six the following year, before we then revisit that you know triple digit decline that unfortunately we've been um, uh, having in the last few years. 500 declined the last two years, remember that. So we're accustomed to triple digit decline. So the next two years, hopefully that'll come about and it'll play out as projected. We're looking at that, that's a variable that's projected. If that changes, then of course that changes our analysis, the multi-year projection as well. Um, and one key element there on the bottom left of the slide is of course, it does not include the January governor's proposal of looking at three options for funding school districts. We already have current funding of average daily attendance for the current year, we can pick that, or the higher of the prior year average daily attendance is introducing a third option, in which case we will look at the three year prior year average daily attendance. And if that's higher, then we would be funded uh, next year based on the three year average, which would include basically the whole harmless protection twice for 1920, 2021, and this year, which is expected to be about 9,800 for P2, um, the actual attendance from the start of the school year through mid-April. And so by doing that average, of course, that would be good news for us, but that is a proposal. And the county office, again, I'm reminding everyone, has told all districts, don't include that in your second interim, in your planning purposes, et cetera. It's a proposal. There's a lot of other competing proposals out there from the legislature. Uh, for the public and for people out there who are interested in this sort of thing, because there's been a lot of talk about the size of the reserve, and I wanted a thorough explanation. I do have a couple more questions, though. Um, so there was something else attached to this. So you came in 2013, so you encouraged the board to increase the reserve, but there was something else going on that I noticed in board policy 3100 that... Uh, we went to the LCFF, so that changed that changed things around a little bit. Can you explain that a little bit more? Yes, thank you, Trustee Nelson. Um, is this better? Am I too close? Back up. Oh my goodness. Okay. okay. Um, um, the transition from revenue limits that have been around from uh, probably 1988. Um, all the way through 2013, um, and 2013 was the first year of implementation of the local control funding formula. So basically, um, prior to LCFF in 2013, all districts in California, whether you were unified, um, uh, high school, um, or elementary, um, we all received the same COLA, flat dollar amount, and it really didn't matter. Um, and there were like eight different exhibits, I did them. So I, I, I'm trying to remember all those different exhibits for well, the first exhibit, blah, blah, blah. I don't wanna bore you with the details, but basically every everybody say received a 215 per student cost of living increase. It was flat funding. And that flat dollar amount represented different percentages for everybody else. And so what negotiations uh, folks and what boards would do is, what does that dollar amount translate to an increase for us locally? And so that happened forever. Um, but that whole premise of the revenue limits was it took a snapshot of the late 80s and then it created this kind of picture that never changed. Um, if you were low funded, then you were still going to be low funded forever. And so irrespective of your needs, of your demographics, if you have English language learners, um, um, socially economic disadvantaged students or foster students. So what Governor Brown did said those three categories that I just mentioned are higher need and therefore would sh shall receive higher funding. And not only that, but then there also he put a, also a threshold. If your percentage of students, you know, exceeded 55% uh, uh, of that category, then you would receive more funding. 
And so the local control funding formula was really aiming at putting more dollars to higher need students and higher need districts. And so what over time, you know, remember this was in place for 40 years, the old system. Over time, the thought is that the local fund local control funding formula would fund higher needy districts at a much higher level than if you didn't have those students and and, and those needs. So that transition started in 2013 and it established a target of repaying school districts back for the previous six or seven years of cuts. So the, in the target funding level was adjusted by inflation, not to reach some kind of national average, it was to reach an 07, 08 adjusted level of inflation because we had cut so deep throughout those years that the target was getting back to 07, 08 adjusted for inflation and repaying for cuts that we had taken basically since the Great Recession. Mm -hmm. And I had a question about the Great Recession. You weren't here, um, so Linda Pacino was here for that. And Mark was I here. left in August of 07. Okay. I am trying <laughs> to here. I thought that teachers took a pay cut because uh, we took furlough days and it was a mess with STRS, but I believe we took a pick around 2010 in order to avoid touching the reserve and to keep personnel. For, for, I, I don't I don't recall any pay cuts. I do recur, recall furlough, furlough days, days, and I believe the furlough days were actually at the end paid paid back. They they were, but the point I'm making is um, the reserve didn't need to be touched at that time because. GTA agreed to take for low days, which meant a pay cut at the time. And then we got it back, but at the time we thought we Yeah, would. that happened. Yes. Okay, I'm not crazy. Huh? My memory is a lot of the driving force behind the 7% was we had recently been taken over by the county, and some members of the board didn't like that very much. So we wanted to ensure that would never happen again. Yeah, I, And that happened because we were living on the edge year after year at 3%. My mm -hmm. very first board meeting in this district, which is exactly almost 15 years ago, the board was debating borrowing from facility funds in order to maintain a 3% reserve. That's the last place a district wants to be. Mm -hmm. And for, you know, and then we had some really tough years statewide in our district. And again, we were just living at that 3% reserve. And although the county didn't actually take us over, there's a, I forgot that term, Alvaro yes. will remember it. Stay and rescind. Yes. They uh, put a, an, uh, they appointed a, a fiscal person to come in and that person started just making cuts However, she felt like making cuts. They didn't align with our priorities. And we never want that to happen again, ever. That was a very bad year that we don't ever want to happen again. And therefore, we can't live on the edge of 3%. We don't even have enough to make payroll. We need to have at least 7%. And we should have 20%. You saw the, the average statewide. The district should have that level of reserve as 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 much as we can, because we don't ever want to be in that position again. And there were some hard years. The recession years were tough. Alvaro came in around that time, and he's done a great job of helping us get our budget to a really good place. Mm -hmm. Trustee Diaz. Oh, Trustee Fayek. I'm sorry, I didn't see your hand. Thank you, Trustee Diaz. Um, I did have a question. Uh, was there a reason why you recommended 7%? Because that doesn't even cover a month of our operational costs. So my question is, are you comfortable with 7% going forward? Or should the board in a future date consider increasing the reserve? Yeah, great I've question. I've been that for since day one. <laughs> right. There was, and, and before Alvaro answers, I can tell you that getting the 7% was a fight on the board. They, we had we had people that I was on the board with who wanted to dip into the three percent reserve for ongoing costs, and so getting them to agree to a seven percent reserve was difficult. I would have preferred a higher reserve, also. So, but now we'll. So that's that's why we only got seven percent. And yeah. uh, Mr. Mesa can probably comment on whether a higher reserve would be desirable or not. 
I would always say yes. Um, and here's why <laughs> reserves is cash. And my recollection coming into the district is we were short on cash, cash. The budget was fine. There were mistakes made, but the budget was fine. Cash was key. And so we were running out of cash because a trend needed to take place, a temporary revenue anticipation note needed to be issued, and it wasn't. Um, because remember, um, the governor at that point said, I'm going to pretend like this proposition will pass. I'm going to cut you 20% and you better solve it. And of course, that didn't happen. And so cash is king. And so the reserves gives you raw cash. And with cash, you can solve a problem because it gives you time. Without cash, you don't have time. And so that's my recollection of, of the facts is that that's what happened. It was a cash issue, not a budgetary issue. Uh, because when we closed the books, we weren't in fiscal distress. You know, Kimberly was here closing the books with me and we weren't in distress. It was a cash issue. And so that's where the reserves come in. The budget can be one thing. Don't get budget confused with raw cash balances. So when Kimberly speaks about a cash flow, that's your raw cash. You have to have cash to pay the bills. That's what the reserves gives you. Um, we can take a mid-year cut on just about anything. The budget's fine. We can we can go through the budget and make adjustments. That's a June, July to June cycle. Cash is a whole different animal. If you're not ready for a for a, basically a loan to meet payroll, you're dead in the water. And I want to I want to say that when we talk about the state of our reserve way back then, this isn't about anybody that was in the district at the time. The district had been underfunded for many many years. We were, you know, uh, not receiving. It still is. It still is. It still is. But particularly back then, you know, we considered ourselves a kind of a low wealth district that received a lot less money. You've seen our posting recently of even today, how our district compares to say a high school district or a basic aid district, and we still receive a lot less money. So the district was doing the best the district could with a really difficult situation, not having enough money to even meet our needs at times. And you know, thanks to Alvaro's leadership, we really, and the boards, thank you, uh, for approving that 7% reserve We've been working on the reserve a long time, and now you see the end result of that when, with a 20% reserve. One of the things I'd like to talk about is um, those of us in education act like the budgetary um, calendar is normal. But for those who are watching and those who aren't familiar with um, school finance, we get paid up till now, might change, we get paid on kids who show up to school. Mm -hmm. So we don't know how many kids are going to show up to school. So we really, we guess, we have an estimate of how many kids. And then you get a bad flu season or a whole bunch of parents deciding to take their kids out on um, a, a, a family vacation or whatever and our attendance goes down, therefore our funding goes down. In January, we get an idea, again, an estimate from the governor about how much money we're going to get next year. Mm -hmm. By And about 87 to 88% of our budget is tied up in personnel. And we have to make a decision by March 15th for the majority of our personnel our certificated teachers and are now are classified. And we have to let them know whether they will be coming back next year or not. Even though we don't know how many kids we're gonna have next year. We don't know how much money we're going to have next year. We have a crystal ball and some estimates. And then we get another estimate in May of how much money we're gonna have next year. And then the legislature passes the California state budget in June. And July 1 starts our new year. <laughs> so 
we don't really have firm figures on next year until June, if they pass it on time, maybe not even until July some years. So if we all ran our own households based on that kind of a calendar, we'd all go nuts. And in education, we talk about, well, July 1 to June 30, that's okay. We can handle this budget. We know how to do this. We know how to handle the craziness of educational finance, which is as firm as quicksand, because we base it on estimates, because we don't have firm figures. So all of you in the business department, you all deal with ambiguity really well. I don't deal with ambiguity well. It would drive me nuts, which is why I'm never <laughs> going to work in a business department for a school district. But it really is kind of crazy. And so, and that is our norm. Anybody else have any questions? Well, comments? Well, but wait, there's more. It, <laughs> it's, it's not, it's not, we don't get the same amount as Palo Alto yep. or Los Gatos or, or any other district is created on some arbitrary random formula by the state. And the best comparison I can use is Gary Unified standing out there on the street corner like beggars, and we get whatever the state chooses to give us based on whatever weird formula they come up with, based on whatever the ADA just happens to be. That's it. We can't, we can't generate income. The, the There's only one tax we can pass, which is a parcel tax, which is the same amount of money on every single parcel that has to be voted in. That's it. We're not a city. We can't ra raise revenues. So we get what we're given and do the best we can with what we got. And we've been very lucky that the citizens of Gilroy have passed, not parcel taxes, but um, measures so that we can rebuild our schools. Because um, without that, we wouldn't have that money to redo that. So um, school finance is an interesting business to be in. <laughs> Anything else? And thank you, Mr. Mesa, for being in school finance and <laughs> keeping us in the black. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, item 7B, monthly district cash flow update. Kimberly Smith, another thank you and kudos to you. You're welcome. Okay, 12 to 18 inches away. Okay, so I'm- Talk loud. Like, what's that? <laughs> Talk loud and what far away. I know, I was like, <laughs> so um, first of all, good evening, board president, superintendent Flores, and members of the board, members of the community. So I'm just gonna bring you up to date on our, our current cash flow and board president, that was a great explanation of school finance. So, um, so this spreadsheet here, this is um, aligned with our second interim that was approved, I think, on the 14th or a couple of weeks ago. And these are based on July through February is based off of actuals. So we're going to look at February there. Um, so the beginning cash balance for February is a little over 53.7 million. The cash that we brought in for the month is a little over 6.8 million. The, the expenses... Um, contracts, services, books, salary, full compensation is a little over 10.8. That 3.9 in the parentheses there, negative, it's a net decrease. And that's due to the, that's a calculation when you take your cash for the month, it was less than what you spent for that month. So then you look down at the bottom there. Yes, we do have a little over 50.4 million there in um, cash balance there. The 84% down there, the 9.1 million, that's total compensation, all classes um, classified, certificated, everyone in the district. And that's 84% of that 10.8 million of your expenses going out for that month. Um, March through June are based off of our best projections at this point in time. And this is just another way of looking at the cash coming in and the expenses going out for the months. I'm sorry. Trustees, any questions? Comments? Okay. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. And now we have item 7C, approval of network engineer supervisor and an update on proposed restructure of information technology department. And this is an action item. Maribel Guisar. 
Good evening, members of the board, Superintendent Flores. Uh, the IT review uh, report included recommendations to review and revise the job descriptions and to reorganize the technology department as we presented um, last board meeting, I believe. These were identified as an immediate need uh, uh, on the report. And tonight, uh, we will review the proposed restructure of the IT department. As you can see in uh, this chart uh, to the left, you see the current organizational chart. Uh, right now, um, it's uh, one um, IT director, IT supervisor, and five technicians. Uh, currently, we have one vacant position. Um, I do want to uh, share uh, some information that I probably should have um, added in this slide, but in 2015, we had about 8,000 uh, um, 8, devices that we supported uh, district-wide between desktops, Chromebooks, network devices. Today, we have over 15,000, so it's quite a bit um, of a change. Um, in this chart, you will see option one and option two, which are the two recommendations in the um, in the report. And these two options um, that are presented here share many uh, similarities. However, I feel that option two is a better fit for organization as it clearly outlines the three main areas of focus um, that we need in our district, which is uh, network and security systems and uh, technical support. And um, therefore we are recommending to go with uh, option two. And uh, Dr. Winslow, Mr. Mesa and I met and we determined that uh, we needed a multi-phase approach uh, to reorganize the department. So I'm gonna invite now uh, Mr. Mesa to talk about the fiscal impact of this reorganization. Thank you, Maribel. Um, as um, Maribel mentioned, um, we can't restructure our department all in one uh, time, right? All in one year is just financially not doable for us at this point. We are recommending a three-phase approach uh, starting next year. Currently this year, we have a vacant position uh, in the department and we're looking at the tech, uh, office assistant, uh, which would be a bargaining unit position um, to basically take place of that position right now. Um, but along with a new position, a network engineer it would be a classified management position. And that's the job description that you're asked to approve tonight uh, with a total compensation of 150,000 that's base salary, statutory rates, those are the CalPERS rates um, that, that drive a, a large piece of that, almost 30% is, is all statutory rates. Uh, and of course, the health benefit uh, component of that. So that's a total number. I don't wanna walk away thinking that anybody makes that as a network engineer in public schools, that's a total compensation package. So phase one would have a total cost of 238,000 um, in next year's budget. Uh, and then phase two uh, would be adding a network technician uh, to the department. And that's another total compensation of 131,000. And phase three um, would add a system analyst. That'd be a classified management position, uh, slightly lower than the engineer, uh, but still a classified management position, high caliber position uh, to then uh, make sure systems are, are working properly, et cetera. And Maribel can kind of walk through you through kind of like a broad overview of what those things are, what those positions, but we have not yet developed the job description for that because that's out in the 24, 25 year, according to a face and plan. Overall though, all faces all together, it would be 514,000 a total compensation that would increase over a period of three years. It's important to recognize that we realize how the need, um, the deep need in technology and infrastructure was not only because of the report that we received from site, but we went through what we went through during COVID and distance learning, heavily reliant on the Department of, of Information Technology to service all those units that Marvel has spoken uh, about and replacing all those units, monitoring of those units and staying on top of all these systems, networks, uh, backup security. I mean, it's just a whole layer of different um, uh, animal that we've asked uh, for IT uh, in a school district to have. So that's why it's needed. 
uh, but a, a multi-year plan so that we can do this in a staggered, thoughtful approach. So at this moment, um, we would like to ask a feedback on this uh, multi-phase and multi-year approach to the destruction of restructure, not destruction, I'm sorry, <laughs> restructure of the IT department. And um, the recommended board action is to approve the network engineer uh, to advertise and fill the position for the 2022-23 uh, uh, school year and to work with CSEA on establishing the new uh, tech office assistant position. Trustees, any comments or questions? Trustee, good. How would the tech office assistant position be different than any other administrative assistant position that we have currently in the district? And why wouldn't we use an existing position description? Thank you, Trustee Good. Um, we have not met with CCA to specify what that is, but our intention is to make it very specific that this position was looking for some more technical skills. So you, it might not be um, where you have a, a site um, staff secretary. Uh, this is somebody who really needs to be able to work with databases, really needs to be able to work with specific applications to support uh, Director um, Maribel and her position uh, and the department in general. So we're going to make sure that while we work with CSCA, we're very transparent about some of the skills that are very specific to IT that we're looking for for the system. So this would not be something that you could transfer to a different department in terms of the person you had? Um, well, we would definitely advertise internally. If there's somebody within the district that could match those skills, it's something that we would definitely look for internally. But it could be somebody on the outside that we might have to find very specific. So it would not be a, our idea is not just a unilateral transfer where we would say, you know, the applications or the soft skills that are necessary specific for a school site would just immediately transfer to the IT department. And, and how would your recommended pay scale with the total comp of 88,000 compare to another similar non-technical assistant position? Correct. So we're looking at the roughly around the, uh, the senior staff secretary range. So okay. that's somebody around the district office that's working uh, with different departments. And that's what we estimated the cost to be. Great. Thank you. Yep. Any questions, board members? Hearing none, I will entertain a motion. This is an action item. So move. So move approval. A second. And a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. So that was for the position. That's for to approve the network engineer position. We're going to give feedback on the multi-phase, multi-year approach. And feedback on the multi-phase, multi-year approach. Thank, Thank you. you. Sounds Vice good. President Pace. <laughs> and that sounds good. Any other comments? Okay. <laughs> Thank you for your comments. Sorry. <laughs> All right. 7D, Expanded Learning Opportunity Program, ELOP. I love our acronyms. And I love that you said it correctly. A lot of people are saying ELOP. Oh, that's And ugly. it's driving all of us nuts. No, it's not ELOP, ELOP. So good evening, Board President Paseno, Dr. Flores, board members. Thanks for the opportunity to come and tell you a little bit about our ELOP plan. So I have a few things I wanna to cover tonight. I just wanna give you an overall view of the funding sources that, we, that, that are combining here. A reminder of the current power school model, the, I, I don't know that I've ever shown you the quality standards for expanding learning, expanded learning programs in the state of California and um, some of the areas of need and proposed solutions that we have and proposed additions to the power school model as well as some expected areas for next steps. So this table shows our funding that we have received. Um, for the past few years, the ACES and 21st Century ACES is the After School Education and Safety. 21st is the 21st Century Community Learning Centers grants um, that we've been receiving for years. ALOP is the new addition to our funding. If you've been hearing about other districts who are concerned about the ELOP and they're actually there are districts requesting to return the funding because the requirements that are attached to it are so 
burdening to them that they would like to just not accept the money. Luckily, we have the existing infrastructure in place. Those districts don't have the ACEs in 21st century infrastructure, so they just don't have the systems in place. Luckily, we do. Most districts in our state only have a single funding source, so they usually only have either ACEs or 21st century. You can see on our table, we have not just one, but two separate 21st century grants, as well as ACEs. So we are positioned very well as far as what our program does and what we operate and how we provide it. And now you can see that this ELOP funding essentially doubled our funding that we have for this year. And there's, along with the, the flexibility and the discussion of how everything's changing, there's actually was at one point a proposal that it may be, instead of the two, two million, it may be up, go up to six for next year. We're guessing it probably won't be that full amount, um, but the state is really investing in expanded learning opportunity programs. And so the, there's a major investment from the governor's part based on the research and the data that, that has been out there around these programs. And then in fact, they came and saw us, like I mentioned before, during the summer, saw it in action and went, this works. So that's where this funding is coming from. Um, as I mentioned, the requirements are all layered in. They're the same. It's a very similar program. It's essentially the same. And their expectation is that whatever, whichever funding source has more strict requirements, those requirements must be followed by all of them. So it's essentially changing the entire structure of the program. So the only differences from what we currently have is that TK and K is supposed to be 10 to 1 instead of our standard 20 to 1, which we've always agreed with. We've never gone over 15 to 1 because we just felt like that was too much for our staff. So we've always maintained a 15 to one in those younger grades anyways. So for us, it's not gonna be that big of a challenge to go down to 10 across the board. And the other big change is the, the districts are now required to offer nine hours year round. It has to be every day of the school year plus at least 30 supplemental days, which can be summer or intercession. Um, our summer program's already, already 30 days. So that works out really well. We have increased our plan for this year. We went from a six hour day to a seven. Um, we're hoping there's going to be some flexibility. I actually spoke to the Senate Budget Subcommittee on this topic and requested some flexibility on this requirement because the model that a nine-hour day would require kind of throws off the functionality. Luckily, we have our, our, our partnerships in place. So if they do say, no, you have to have nine hours, I'm expecting what we'll do is come back to you and request a contract with YMCA to come in and do a sports program for the last two hours of the day. So we can build our, make our seven hour program meet the nine hour requirement, but we're hoping to have some flexibility there um, for this year. So quick reminder of what our power school program is. We're now at 10 sites where ACEs and 21st century grant funded for seven. You approved earlier in the year the ELOP funding to add Brownell, Solarzano, and remove the fees from the Luigi program. So we, you know, just quick description of the program is up there already. Um, so now Youth Alliance and YMCA, our partner agencies, manage programs at five sites each daily until six o'clock. And I'm super excited about this part, our summer program. We've always had our elementary sites are op operated by one is Youth Alliance and one is YMCA. And this year, we're all there. We're all really excited about co-managing. They're really wanting to work together in, at all the sites. So now, the vision of all kids benefiting from the strengths of all of our partner agencies is happening, and we're all excited about it. So, I can't tell you enough how excited I am. So, we last year we switched the program model instead of calling it Superpower Summer Camp, with which was a mouthful for everybody. We decided to call it the summer learning program because last year we embedded the teachers, we brought the teachers in and it was a different model. We liked that, so we're sticking with that. So there's some changes, we're kind of going back to some of what we did well before and we're trying to keep that component. So summer learning program, we will be at the three sites. As I mentioned, we'll, we expect to serve about 300 or 700 students this year across the three sites. This is another part that I'm really excited to be able to show you. The quality standards for expanded learning have been around for Ever. I mean, I guess it's not been forever. I remember when they created them, but I guess I've been around for forever. Um, anyway, so the learning and after school and summer principles is the context that all of this is built on. So there was a lot of research that was done years ago around what, what does learning look like? What does good learning look like in after school and summer programs? And so those are the five components there. Learning that's active, collaborative, meaningful, supports mastery, and expands horizons. That's how we're going to get kids to grow. And then the state has developed the quality learning, uh, the quality standards for expanded learning. And basically it's 12 areas of 
emphasis that we need to make sure that we focus on. You probably noticed if you reviewed the, the grant, it's all, or the plan and the grants, they're all around those 12 categories. This is what everything is directed at focusing on these quality standards. They have them laid out very nicely where the first six are refer referred to the point of service quality standards. So those are the things that you would see on a school site or in a classroom. Those are the things that are happening on the ground. And then they have the other seven through 12 are the programmatic quality standards. So that's the behind the scenes, that's the foundation, that's the legwork, that's the how does that all fit together. So those are quality standards seven through 12. Um, that's kind of guiding all of our work. So in order for us to use this money to continue to expand and improve on the quality of our program, the following needs have been identified. So we are still struggling with staffing. Um, it's an issue across the state as with many, many areas and after school staffing is still remains low. So we're working with our partner agencies on increasing the pay for the staff at all levels so that we can make sure that we can engage people and keep them. And one of the other things that I never, it's always been an issue, but once we were like, we have this money and we said, what do we do? How do we, how do we fix program? And it was, oh my God, we need a yard duty on site. So there's just daily site operation inefficiencies that just are just the nature of the beast. And so we realized we want to, we're requesting to add a yard duty position at each site. And we feel like that's going to really improve our quality of programming because it will free up other people to do other jobs. We also have a lot of need for additional support from the district level. And so we're looking for a program manager and a program coordinator level uh, positions that would be able to provide support at the, at the site level from the district perspective, as well as on the programmatic side. So just to kind of give you a, a ballpark idea, the expected annual costs of all of these positions that are requested here, in addition to the annual costs of Luigi Aprea, Brownell, Solarzano, everything that we've added up to this point, totals about 1.4 million. Now, remember, we have $2 million that we are supposed to spend this year. So the approximately $600,000, and there will be carryover. Carryover will be allowed for the next few years, so we'll have some wiggle room here. But the approximate $600,000 that we'll have left, what our plan is, is once we get all these positions in place and we get all these things up and running and we see where we are, then we intend to go out and do more gather more data and more feedback from families and from the community and find out what are the needs, what remaining needs are there and how do we address them. And so then we will identify the plan for the next step for the rest of the funding. So it's kind of a tiered in approach for how to, how to handle this funding. Just to give you kind of an idea of what the structure of PowerSchool looks like, currently there are two district employees that are involved with PowerSchool. It's myself and the program secretary for PowerSchool. Everyone else in PowerSchool is either YMCA or Youth Alliance. So the agencies each provide a community director or a director level position that oversees expanded learning, not only in Gilroy, but in their other communities as well. So there's each agency also has other communities. And then there's a program director position that oversees just Gilroy Power School sites. And that's our leadership team. That's the Power School leadership team that I meet with often twice a week. And we're, we're really everything we do is, is working together to, to guide the program. And then each site consists of a site coordinator, an assistant site coordinator, and somewhere between four and eight program leaders, depending on the funding and how many students we, we serve. Um, that bottom section down there in the center, that just shows you which agencies run which sites. And the purple boxes are the ones that we're hoping to get approved in this plan so that we can then move forward and, and figure out our next steps from there. So we have like the 10 yard duty positions, one per site, as well as the um, expanded learning program manager and program coordinator positions. And some of the ex expected areas for next steps are the restorative practice system development and implementation. All of our staff have been trained in the IIRP restorative practices and con the connection practice. And everybody's really excited about the impact and the changes that they're seeing already with the interactions with students and how that's going. So we really want to engage in that process and expand on it. Um, and that's going to take more work and planning. We want to make sure we're doing it in a wise way. We also have, have had some behavioral concerns um, and other barriers for participation for some students. You already approved, when you approved the, the, the Brownell and Solarzano and Luigi program, you also approved some new positions. Those have remained unfilled. We're still trying to fill our basic classroom positions so we can get our numbers up because we're still not serving the numbers of students that we would like to serve because we don't have enough staff. 
So those have remained unfilled and there's some initial beginning talks with Rebecca's and Community Solutions about maybe contracting with them to provide like peer mentors and case managers so that we can have additional supports on site to help those kids with behaviors and meeting some additional needs that way. And uh, we also are really excited about the coordination of additional vendors to provide enhanced enrichment opportunities. We started years ago with, we had Royal King Dance Academy came in. That's one of the main vendors that we had and it went so well and then now it's taken off and it's going through the schools. So we wanna bring them back as well as finding other vendors, right? We have the opportunity, our, remember our goal, one of our, our goals is to expand horizons, right? We wanna give kids these new opportunities, expose them to things they've never seen and never done so they can see the world differently. So we're really excited about bringing in some additional vendors. And um, another option, because we have already have such abundant funding, we, are, we will, it looks like we'll probably need to open at the high schools. When we have, if, as we have more money, we will need to open programs at the high schools, which I think is really beneficial because we supported the kids through elementary. They have the connections and the relationships and the supports, and then they get to middle school and high school and we're like, bye, see you later, you're on your own. So that's really exciting to think about being able to expand to the high schools. But the program is going to look totally different there because it's a completely different beast than what we do, right? So we know that. So that's one of the things that we're expecting when we need to design a program and make sure we're working with the high schools and make that happen. So that's a big one I think I foresee coming. And then also just continuing to identify the unique family needs of our disengaged students. We still have a lot of students who are disengaged and so how do, and, and families who are still struggling. And so how do we meet those needs? How do we support them? So that's going to be a lot of the, the next steps that we have to work on. And that's it. So if you have any questions, trustees, questions, comments? Not a question, Trustee Nelson. Um, so you're uh, having some difficulty filling some positions. It says the proposed solution is to work with partner agencies to increase pay. Have you already had this conversation? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And have they been receptive? Oh, yeah. So one of the issues is because they work with so Hollister Youth Alliance, or Youth Alliance works in Hollister and San Juan and other areas. The YMCA that we work with is the Silicon Valley YMCA. So it goes, you know, so they can't they can't just pay more in Gilroy because mm -hmm. they have to make sure it's consistent within their, you know, they have their own things they have to look at too. But because we have this additional funding, what we're talking about is some new things that we're bringing. Um, for example, like the restorative practices. I feel like this, I've had conversations with people at the state. They see districts like Gilroy that are already dual funded. So now we're tri-funded. They already are expecting us to be a role model and a model in the, for what can happen. So it seems like what they're looking at is they want those communities that are, that are funded well to really dive into something and do it really, really well so that they can be the model in the state. And they can say, hey, you want to learn about, in my mind, I'm hoping for, you want to learn about restorative practices? Go to Gilroy. They've got it. Go look at what they're doing in power school over there. And then we have this system that's in place, right? So um, I just got excited and I forgot even what your question was. I hope I answered it. <laughs> Were they receptive? Were the outside oh. agencies receptive? Yes. Okay. So, yes. So that, thank you, that reminded me. So the idea was we'll need to have different, this position will be different than what it looks like in Hollister or in San Jose, right? And so we're going to be able to adjust the job descriptions possibly a little bit so that they, we can pay more in Gilroy. Um, but that takes a lot of, as you can imagine, that takes a lot of work to work that out with the, the Asian, but they're definitely on board with it. Other questions, trustees? Um, Mandy, you mentioned that you were hoping for flexibility regarding the nine hours, and this is for implementation next year, right? This, we, this summer. <laughs> the, yeah, this summer. But I don't know. When do we hear the June. next? I don't know. I'll so, know when we should hear the next. I was going to ask, so when will you hear? So, yeah, I may revise. So in May, we find out whether we have flexibility for nine, nine hours or seven hours. And so as Again, I was, ambiguity in education. And as I was putting this together, I thought, maybe we should just plan for it and just do it. So I kind of, I, we've already been talking about it with the YMCA about if it's possible and if they have enough staff that could do something like that. So one of the things we need to do is find out how many families would be interested. You know, we're going to go till 3.30 already. That may be enough for many of the families. Mm -hmm. So we want to find out how much interest is there, and then we can identify how much need there is, and can we get sure. the staffing. And so I think that's going to be one of our questions when we reach out to families is, are you interested in something until 5.30? The positions that are still open now, 
these are the positions that um, the other agencies will, you will come up with a different job description. So what, so they're just empty from now to June? Or? So right now there's, there's existing like program leader positions. If anybody's interested, where's, I don't know which the camera is. If anybody's interested in a job, please reach out to YMCA and Youth Alliance. We, we want really, really want people in the classrooms now. We just have empty classrooms. So we're not serving the number of kids we should be serving right. at this moment. Um, and the and the issues with hiring is do you, any they're they're I mean every, they're interviewing constantly as soon as they have someone they're interviewing I think one of the expect you know our expectations are really high for our program we expect them to do a lot and I think we have had quite a few people who've come in and they've worked about a week and they've left so you know our expectations are really high. Um, but we also have people who come in and are fabulous. And so we're, we, you know, we've just, we're just going to keep plugging away. Okay. So this is an action item. And we are to uh, vote on approval of the ELOP plan, correct? Yes. Ms. Michelle, I move approval. This is Melissa. I'll second that. Thank you. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Great, motion carries. Thank you. Item 7E, A to G, Completion Improvement Grant Plan and A to G, Learning Loss Mitigation Grant. Information item, thank you. Thank you, President Dr. Padilla. Thank you, President Pizzano, trustees, Dr. Flores. I am here to present to you the A through G. This is a one-time grant funding for districts in California. So I will be reviewing you, with you basically the who, what, why, and where of this grant as a draft. It is currently in draft stage. So the purpose of the funds is really to support our underrepresented populations. For us, that is our EL, it is our socioeconomic disadvantaged, and our foster youth. We also include our special education population um, because of their low A through G rate as well. So the plan requirements are really to improve our services for those unduplicated pupils, to also identify, which we have already done, all of those students who received a D or an F. Please remember for A through G eligibility, you must have a C or better. We tell students all the time that D gets you a diploma, but you must have a C to get to college. So for A through G, you have to have that C or better. So we identify all students that received a D or F, or as you remember, we did offer NC or no credit for students um, for spring of last year. Uh, we also need to make sure that we are supplementing and not supplanting the actions that we currently have in our LCAP. And we then finally have to report out and describe how we use these funds to in fact improve eligibility for our students. So there are really four areas where we can use this funding source. First of all, for professional development or lovingly termed PD. So we can have PD for administrators, for teachers, as well as for our counselors. We can use it to support our current programs and to look at advising students and offer courses to get them through A, A through G. Providing access to A through G coursework, and we'll talk about how we're already there, but how we get from that D to that C level. And then also we can use this to subsidize fees for students um, for tests that they take, for example, the advanced placement exams that also help them with their college eligibility. So we must develop and present a draft plan by April 1 of 2022, which is why I'm here today. Uh, we do have an internal board approval date of August 2022. Keep in mind that is internal. The state has not given us a date by which we must have it approved, okay, only that it must be presented to you. But we have decided that August is a good date since we must be implementing by August. 
And then we will be reporting out in December of 2023 on our progress so far. And then our final report is due to the state in August of 2026. So this is a, a funding source that lasts us for approximately three years. So this goal fits right, or this grant fits right into our board goals already, um, because as you know, part of your objectives are to increase the level of student achievement for all students. Um, and here will be the focus on our underrepresented groups. So now for our plan goal. What do we want? Really, we want to strengthen and expand our district program so that all students um, can achieve that level of success and close the opportunity gap for our subgroups. So why? Why do we need to do this? So as you know, we did in fact um, change our graduation requirements to what we call A through G default. The first graduating class under that requirement was the class of 2018. So you can see that just by changing those requirements, just that one detail has moved us from what you see in 2016 at a 35.7% um, A through G eligibility rate to over a 51% rate. So we're on the right track. Then after 2018, as we started to implement some more things, we've gone into COVID. So we've taken a little bit of a step back, but now we are getting back on track. And we do believe we will be soon into that category of the state goal of 65.5% or higher A through G eligible rate. So as you can see, and the big reason for us why we want to implement this grant is because we still do have an opportunity gap in Gilroy. So as you can see, our Hispanic population, our socioeconomic disadvantage, our homeless population, students with disabilities and English learners are significantly lower in terms of that A through G eligibility. And we wanna make sure that they have the exact same opportunities of success as all of our other students in the district. So you can see um, from this chart kind of an overall rate, um, but also the rate for our junior colleges and our rate for our four year. Our four year is traditionally lower than our two year. That's also the state because we encourage all of our students to seek some form of higher education. And as I mentioned in our last report about um, our CTE courses is that our junior colleges are our biggest source for trade. And we encourage our students to continue on with either a trade or going on to a four year to reach their eventual career goals. Because we are a career in college focus, we want all of our students to aspire to a career that they love, and we want to make sure that they have access to the systems they need to reach that career. Sometimes that is a two year school, sometimes that is a four year school. So our plan. Our plan is in draft, form. We just received our allocation of approximately $834,000 that again goes over three years. We just received that less than a month ago. Um, so we are trying to put a plan together, hence draft, <laughs> um, to get it to you by April 1st. And we will be working on that and continuing to work on it until August 1st. But our two main areas of focus is one access. So we already have access at our high school levels to the A through G coursework. Students must take A through G coursework to receive a diploma from us. So we have that, but where are we falling a little bit short? We're, we're falling short in terms of our students who are receiving Ds, our students who are receiving Fs, um, as well as some of our special education students in getting them access to those A through Gs. So we will be looking at course placement for them to make sure that all students have that access. We will be looking at also um, a program where I, I write in the report, it is AVID or AVID-like strategies. AVID is a research-based program that really focuses on study skills and the other types of um, 
skills other than academic that you need to be successful, not only in high school, school but to go into college. So we are looking at that as a possi possible resource for our schools, um, or again, the AVID like. So we do have that already at GECA as an AVID like program um, for their coursework, um, but we do not have it at our comprehensives at this point. We are also looking at um, things that we can do to expand that access, such as dual enrollment. We have dual enrollment um, with our junior colleges, Gavlin, um, mainly at our schools, but it's very limited. So we want to see how we can increase that and support our students to be taking some of our junior co um, college coursework while still in high school. Uh, we also are going to be looking at AP readiness. This gets back to that idea of rigor, that we want our students to be ready to take the most rigorous coursework we have available in our schools, which is our AP coursework at the, at the high school level. We're also going to be focusing a lot of this grant on the learning loss mitigation. This really goes into our summer program, as well as into our early morning, our zero period and our seventh period credit recovery courses to provide more opportunity for them. As you know, we already have quite a large summer school for our credit recovery. We have not to date been able to do this for our what we call D cleanup to help our students move from a D grade to a C grade. So we're hoping to expand both the school year as well as the summer program to help with that D cleanup and give students that opportunity to improve their grade to make them A through G ready. Uh, we're also going to be focusing on grading practices um, because what we look at is as a system, do we have a clear way to explain to our families and to our students what our grading practices are? So in some cases we do. In some cases, especially with some of our newer teachers, we need to help them understand how we grade um, so that we are more consistent and our students know, in fact, how it helps them to understand the grading practices of their teachers. That's, in fact, one skill that they teach in AVID is how to talk to your teacher about grades and what grades mean in that class. Um, we are also going to be looking at co-teaching. Co-teaching comes in many different models. We are currently looking at really helping our, not only our special education teachers, but also some of our paras on how they can help with the academic support within the classroom. So there are extremes in co-teaching where some, and on the far end, it is two teachers who are literally teaching the class together at the same time, but then there are also different levels. So we're starting at that basic level of how do we help with academic support and how do we support one another? And then monitoring. How are we going to see if what we're doing is working? So we are going to continue to monitor our A through G completion rate and that we do every year. And you also see that normally in our fall reports about how we are doing, um, not only on our AP test scores, but also on how we're doing. You'll see, and you see it on here, that percent of students on track in mathematics, right? Um, because we want them to be on track or have completed math two or math three by a certain year, okay? Which will show us whether or not they are college ready. And um, that's also our big hindrance, which is why we're looking at starting that co-teaching and learning about how to support academics in the classes in math, um, because right now that is our weaker area for A through G readiness. We're also continuously looking at our credit recovery data, which right now is very strong. So we have um, a very successful summer program for credit recovery and the number of students that we actually get to graduation through credit recovery. Um, during our um, school year program, we are actually at about a 75% pass rate for credit recovery during the school year. We're at about 65% pass rate of students receiving a C or better during that credit recovery. So it has been very successful for the students that are taking those programs. Um, right now it is limited, however, on um, both sites, we only have um, two sections each. So we do want to be able to increase that to allow more students to be able to take that option. 
And that is the end of my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions. Trustees, questions? Trustee Aguirre. Thank you. Just maybe a clarification mm -hmm. for those that at home might not know what A through G readiness is. So yes, A through G, and this time it is not an acronym, believe it or not. <laughs> so A through G, A through G are basically the categories and they are labeled um, letters A through G that students must um, have coursework in each of those areas in order to um, qualify for a state or UC school in California. Um, most other colleges throughout the country also use a similar system. Um, it's not necessarily labeled A through G, however. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Other trustees? Trustee Nelson. Hi. So you answered one of my questions that I emailed earlier. You have a 75% pass rate? Pass, or, so D or better, yes. About 75%, but 65% for D, for correct. D. So D we want to get up to C. Which is right now about 65%. But we only have two sections right now? We have two sections per high school. So two classes? Correct. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's why we want to expand that. Currently, we are only offering for students who failed a course. We are not offering for that D cleanup yet. Not, not yet. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, could you explain more about grading practices? Because as a teacher, I experienced that, you know, I would grade one way and somebody else would grade another way. I didn't necessarily agree. So how would you ensure any kind of consistency? And then teachers have the right to create their own grade they absolutely have the right to create their own grading system what we want is that it's clear to students and to parents from the day a student walks into that course so they know this is what i need to do in order to be successful in this course this is how the grading is going to be laid out by the teacher so they know if they are on a point system what that point system looks like if they're on a percentage system so what percentage must they get in which categories in order to be successful and what it means to them. What we don't want and what does happen um, within not just our system, but most high schools, is that a student falls behind at the beginning and then by the quarter, they're so far behind that mathematically they can't catch up, right? So we want students to know and parents to know from day one Here's our grading system. This is why we have it. This is how it's going to work throughout the semester. So, and although some teachers do that, it is not all teachers that currently have that level of exp explanation. So we want to make sure that the teachers understand, especially our new teachers coming in, um, because often teachers use the same grading practices that were given to them by a mentor teacher. And they may not even understand it themselves, except for our math teachers who understand the math down to a T, but they may not understand it. So we want them to understand the grading system that they're using, and we want them to be able to clearly communicate that to families. Well, I know at Christopher, and I assume it's other places, you know, we have to submit the syllabus, or mm -hmm. we did, and, you know, and it explains, it has the grading right on the syllabus, and that's the beginning of the semester. It will normally say in some what our board policy is for what constitutes a grade and what percentage they must get, but not down to that level of detail of how much is, you know, how many tests am I going to have per semester and what is in that testing category? What does homework count? So again, some do, not all. Um, any other questions? Comments from any of Oh, yeah, questions? I had one more question. Okay. Uh, Christopher High School piloted a mastery period mm -hmm. this last semester, well, this semester. How is that going to fit into this plan? It's going to be on top of the zero period. So that mastery period. period is not necessarily for credit recovery. Um, and because of the time that it is throughout the um, this semester, it's really not set up for a credit recovery. It is for a support. So how I see it working is they may want to include, for example, those AVID-like strategies during that time to support all students on their campus. So it would be a good time to implement something like that and support them. But credit recovery would still be probably as a seventh period for students um, because of the time it would take for them to complete those courses. Mm -hmm. Trustee Fiak. Um, so I know uh, 
there was a mention that power school might go into the high school. So is there maybe planning on doing some sort of a combination of after school credit recovery and um, like social emotional learning that power school and their partners are so good at doing? It could be. Right. Those are certain things. Um, keep in mind, it is still a challenge at the high school level um, to get our students to attend um, the zero, the seven or the summer, um, because the number normally we get about half the students to attend summer school that should be going to summer school. So one thing that we'll be working on is how we make it more appealing to students to attend these and attend these at a younger age. Um, normally our credit recovery is for juniors. They get, and obviously our seniors um, who need to finish up, but our juniors who need it, um, but we have not had the funding always to, um, to offer it to ninth grade up. We do with this have that funding. So we do wanna look and see how we make it appealing to them to be able to come um, after school, take credit recovery and yes to partner um, with a program like Power School. I guess I think that if you add pro-social activities, that might be more incentive. It, it could. For kids to attend. That and food. Yes. yes. So yes. hopefully. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Feed them. <laughs> right. <laughs> Trustees, any other comments or questions? Okay. okay. Thank you, Dr. Padilla. I will Padilla. see you in August. Thank you. Thank you. And we have item 7F an increase to the master contract with the Bay School for the 21-22 school year. And this is an action item. Uh, Ms. Good Polito. E good evening, um, board president, um, board members, and Dr. Flores. I'm here to present an increase for a contract with a non-public school for us to be able to place a student to provide services, additional student. Trustees, any questions or comments? Okay, seeing none, I will entertain a motion to approve. Is this twin I approve? Ms. Michelle, second. Okay, approve. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. 8A, monthly maintenance operations and facilities update. Right on time at nine o'clock. <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen, Paul Nato and Dan McAuliffe. Why don't you start? Okay. I was told to make this quick. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening, Dr. Flores, President Pisano and school board. And I have to reiterate, it is nice to see you all face to face and live audience. Uh, I have uh, two items for you tonight. Uh, both with EF and S concrete, they're small projects. Uh, they were supposed to get done earlier in the year, but due to COVID and some issues with uh, EF and S, they were delayed in being able to have me bring this to you. Uh, both of these items, if approved, would be uh, funded with routine restricted maintenance uh, and could be done during the April break. Uh, first one is a contract with EFNS for wheel stops at the Mount Madonna High School parking lot. Now that sounds a little strange to put wheel stops in there, but that parking lot is a very large open parking lot. It's been a big problem with cars after hours spinning out and having parties. Uh, we looked at putting gates there. We can't gate off the, the parking lot, but we think a good way to mitigate that problem is to put the wheel stops in each spot uh, so the cars can't do the the spinning out. Neighborhood will like that very much if we get that done. The other is also a contract with the FNS for the removal of the raised dirt area at the new playground at Glenview that uh, Paul did such a great job on. Uh, the district, uh, I think once they saw that area, would like to see that return to the field. So it's a concrete curbed area with raised dirt. And this also could be done during the uh, holiday break in April for the cost of $9,500. And I just have a very quick, oops, what did I do here? I'm stuck. You want to go to the next one? Yeah, next slide. Well, thank you. 
I am sorry I don't have a lot of pictures of what we've done over the last uh, couple months, but I promise to bring you more in April. Uh, this is one example of something that got done at the district office, GECA, and our own yard. You can see the old existing awning. Uh, you gave us approval to do this pre-COVID. This fell in the COVID black hole, and we <laughs> finally recovered with the vendor and were able to get this done here a few weeks ago. So it made a big difference at the district office and especially at GECA. I got several uh, emails of thank yous from uh, GECA for what they were able to get there. It made a big improvement over their side windows. And just a few things we've been doing. Uh, we are still, unfortunately, following level two trout restrictions. Uh, the city has been really helpful with us. Uh, we've been able to negotiate uh, some watering in other areas that really need it, like the Brownell field by reducing in other areas. So they've been really workable with us because the reality is Brownell, it's a beautiful field, but the grass is not well established. It can't tolerate the, the lack of water and only being watered once a week. So city has been very helpful. Uh, we are in the process of developing our summer projects list and all the scope of work. We'll have a hefty list this year. Uh, I'm pretty excited about what we are able to get done. And fortunately I was able to hand off to Mr. Nadow, the uh, Gilroy High roofing project who will be leading that up over the summer. And that's much needed and I'm looking forward to getting that done. Uh, we are also, for the first time in a few years now, planning our summer team cleaning with our custodial staff. That We have not been able to do that for the last few years. Uh, I think our even our staff is excited to get back on board with that. Uh, it's a very productive process. Uh, and we have been shorthanded custodial-wise, uh, but most of our veteran custodians have been working overtime. Uh, some have been working weekends uh, to fill the needs. Uh, with COVID reducing greatly here, it's not so bad right now, and HR has helped us. We have been able to put on a couple more subs, so we're, our staffing is looking much better. Uh, our maintenance and grounds are also working very hard. Our entire department uh, is doing other things around the district, driving warehouse trucks, food service trucks, and our own uh, transportation veteran office coordinator, Linda Fagoni, who's still a bus driver has jumped into transportation occasionally when they're really short staffed and driven a bus and a shift for a day. Uh, the other good thing in our department, our grounds crew is now fully staffed. I don't think we've been fully staffed since I've been here for 10 years. We are fully staffed and it, our sites are seeing the improvement. So big improvement in our departments. That's all I have for you this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, President Paseno. Dr. Flores, members of the board. Uh, let's see, I'll carry on our quick update. Um, we'll do, let's see, we did a tour at South Valley with the uh, facilities subcommittee. And I think most of the board was able to make that day. Um, it's a little over overcast, but um, still, I think we got a good, good vision of what South Valley is becoming. So thank you guys very much for coming out. Uh, the next tour, I'm not sure if we'll have a lot of that concrete in, but it would be very nice to be able to show you that uh, the campus really takes on a change when that occurs. Let's see, so just for anybody who wasn't there, you're looking at the uh, A and B pods and uh, the picture on the right, we're actually walking into the A pod. Um, and then the picture on the left is inside one of the classrooms. You can see the elevated classrooms. So this is decidedly different than Brownell. And I think we really do strive for individuality on every campus. So this particular school is gonna, um, it's gonna have the actually trusty good slanted roofs and their open beam ceiling. So that's gonna give a, a level of elevation. It's gonna feel bigger. Um, and then what we're looking at on the right is actually gonna be uh, featured uh, the facade on the outside of the library and a lot of the classrooms. It's really gonna give a difference of um, contrast in the buildings as they come out. So I'm really looking forward to that section. Those will be on around early June. So hopefully we'll get a chance to see that then. Um, Let's see, back uh, the class of 1971 came by. Actually, there's been many classes, as Dr. Flores knows, I think she's been in discussions with a few different classes from the original Gilroy High School Mustangs uh, on this site. 
Um, these folks came by to tour the uh, the the senior quad, and uh, I think they took a picture over their plaque. If you're not aware, uh, on this campus there are a number of of brass plaques that were generated each year by the graduating class. And then they were embedded into the courtyard somewhere. So we're actually going to resurrect those. When we demise the school, we're very well aware of where every single one of them are. Um, what we're going to do with them is still up in the air. Um, but we're working on either um, we were there's there's a small discussion about actually migrating them to Gilroy High School. Um, there's more discussion about leaving them in place to memorialize the fact that this site was the original high school. Some more to come on that. Um, so this is, yeah, the class of 1971. I do know we've heard from the class of 1967 and a few others. Um, so we're looking forward to actually doing some tours uh, with those folks before the, for, before the actual demolition of this site uh, comes out. And then uh, just last week, we were able to tour the staff. So the South Valley staff was actually able to go out and take a look at where their new classrooms are going to be and get a first look at mm -hmm. what their new campus will look like. Um, there was a lot of questions on this tour. Um, hopefully, we were able to answer all of them. Um, storage was a big question, <laughs> um, but we uh, uh, I think we got, uh, got a very good um, response out of most of them. Um, so I'm looking forward to seeing that uh, evolve and being able to give them another tour. Um, hopefully one more before they uh, leave for the summer uh, and come back. Cause when they come back, it's going to be, it'll be done. They'll be teaching in those rooms within days. Um, so looking forward to that. And that's all we have. I will move on to the other items we have. Um, this evening, I am joined by a special guest from our Citizens Oversight Committee, Ms. Don Johnson, who has more titles in the district than I think most of us do. Um, but she's here to give you the annual report on the Citizens Oversight. Um, take it away, Don. Good evening, Dr. Flores and board. And it's January 19th, 2022 meeting. The Citizens Oversight Committee reviewed the 2020-2021 annual financial audit specific to Measure E and Measure E, Measure P bond activities. This report prepared by an independent third party provides additional assurance that the district is expending bond funds appropriately. And as a member of the Citizens Oversight Committee, we agree and approve the expenditures. Are there any Thank questions? You so much. Trustees, do you have any questions? Thank you for your service on the bond committee. I was just going to say that. Thank you to the citizens, citizens of Gilroy for passing those two bonds and thank you for overseeing them. It's fun. <laughs> <laughs> and keeping us on track. Excellent. Thank you for hanging in there and you're definitely free to go if unless you want to see us fumble through the rest of this. You got it. Um, I'll walk us through the rest of our items so we can uh, conclude tonight's meeting. Um, if the board approves, we'll uh, I'll just read out each one of our items and vote normally. So let's see, item 8C is the approval of and the purchase of an installation of classroom furniture for South Valley Middle School, not to exceed $837,649.33. Um, so this is the classroom furniture purchase. It's just the classrooms, it's not the admin, not the gym. And um, it's uh, furnished through KI Furniture, which is exactly, it's our classroom standard. We, I think, settled on that at Brownell. The furnishings will be almost identical to Brownell in every way. Uh, we're setting up the middle schools exactly the same way. Um, the pricing for this particular uh, purchase was, it, we've changed the piggyback contract, if you will, we're using an FCCC program, which is a little bit different than like Sourcewell. This particular one afforded us a better price because they hadn't hiked up their prices yet. Um, they didn't, usually there's an increase. They had not increased their price yet. And this one includes installation. So usually I would come back to you in a month or so with the installation costs. This is already embedded. Um, so dollar for dollar, we're spending about exactly what we did for at Brownell per classroom 
but we're getting the installation at the same cost. So usually you see price hikes and everything's costing more, which it is. I'll, I'm panicked about that every day. This is not one of those cases. Um, and I would like to point out, I have a feeling it has a lot to do with our relationship with KI. Uh, Leanna Hammer in our purchasing department is been, I think, instrumental in that relationship building over the years. So quick hats off to her. I think she's probably uh, more deeply involved than even I know, but that we've got a great relationship with KI and I just can't wait to get that stuff installed. Um, I'll move on to item 8D. It's the approval and purchase of storage containers uh, for bike and book storage at the South Valley Middle School. Now, I want to pay a little bit of uh, special attention to this. This is not something I've already introduced to the facility subcommittee. So anytime I bring something to the board, it's usually always vetted through the subcommittee. This item came up a little faster than we were expecting, and I didn't get a chance to get it in front of the subcommittee. So there are two storage containers that we wish to purchase. They are, uh, one is for book storage and one is for bike storage. Now, you know, South Valley and Solorzano have a bike program that was sponsored heavily by Specialized. Um, so South Valley is currently storing their bikes on campus and in classrooms. Um, and it's not uh, it's not great. What we really want to do is launch that program correctly. We want to store these bicycles in a storage locker specifically designed to store them and enable the students to ride. Um, so with that, we've gone out and got quotes. Um, in fact, Trustee Good was instrumental in this. We got a great price uh, on a better container than what we had originally found. So we've talked about it, but I didn't bring both of those to the subcommittee ahead of time. So I just want to make sure you're aware of that but we are asking for your permission to purchase two. Uh, one is for the bikes. The second is actually to become our interim book room and library storage for South Valley in this next school year because they will not have one. Uh, we're gonna take down the library this, this June and they're gonna be without. So our project manager, Marissa uh, Van Patten and the library clerk at South Valley have put together a program where we're going to mobilize the library and push into the classrooms over the next year through mobile carts. They're book carts with two sides on them. We got them, uh, we've got them very inexpensively and I think they're an agenda item here. Um, so we'll be able to push those into the classrooms for the students to be able to work with. We have a small room that's been dedicated by Principal Ramos uh, to be able to act as a library, but we're gonna have to cycle books in and out. Uh, yes. Question, going back to storage containers, the, the board briefing indicates two storage containers. The invoice just specifies one. So I assume we're gonna buy two exact same price. Yes, they're both, uh, but they're that's the total price. Fifteen thousand is for both. Right. Okay. So it's I think it's like seven thousand delivered um, per. Okay. Um, so yeah, thank you for that. Um, so yeah, the second uh, container is uh, to basically be be their book storage and um, interim storage for library books. Uh, they'll have a small classroom that they'll be able to display and allow students to browse, but not as many books as a as a dual immersion program needs uh what do we have room for so that's what the second one will go for and you may be thinking what are we going to do with that container after next year way ahead of you no i'm not behind i'm not ahead of you uh but we will be using it at either brownell or solazano for their bike program so uh, right now there's a storage container that it's not in good repair at solazano um, so that more than likely will replace the one that they're currently using. We'll set that up, deliver that over to Solarzano, take care of both of them. At, uh, or in, it, it depends because Brownell doesn't have their bikes yet. So depending on the, the quickness of need, um, but we'll determine it at that point. So long-term, we've got a home for that container. Um, item 8E is the approval of a contract with Oh, that's E, F, and S. That's, both of those are Dan's items. And then my last item is the uh, approval of purchase of the library cards um, for uh, $4,495.13. So those are 20 wooden bookshelves that will be able, uh, they're mobile, so they'll on casters and we'll be able to migrate books back and forth for the next school year um, for South Valley. Thank um, you. Trustees, no. any questions or comments? 
Okay, seeing none, I will entertain a motion for approval of items 8C through G. So moved. Ms. Michelle, second. Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. And item nine, board member reports. Do we have any? Okay, seeing none. On to item 10, upcoming new referral agenda items. Uh, Trustee Fia, sorry. Um, I would like to have a discussion at a future date of um, whether we should increase our uh, reserve. So how much did uh, Alvaro pay you to say that tonight? <laughs> Okay, anything else from, yes, I'll, Trustee I'll, Good. I'll, I'll second Trustee Fiax. I thought you Trustee, might. Yeah. <laughs> Any other items? Okay, seeing none. So item 11, announcements. The next regular meeting of the Board of Education will be held Thursday, April 21st. Closed session will begin at 5.30, followed by the regular meeting at 7 p.m. The agenda will be available on the district's website by 5 p.m. on Friday, April 15th. And this meeting is adjourned. Yay. Welcome back. <laughs> Yeah. A little rocky start, but we've got a good point. Any more rocky than any other. <laughs> <laughs> Not you, just anyone. <laughs> okay.